All right, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for coming to a uh, technical deep dive on VMware Horizon View performance and best practices. So, uh, my name is Travis Wood. I'm a senior solutions architect in our global technology and services team. So, I get to fly around the world doing uh, design engagements for our beta products with our customers. And with me, I have uh, Ray Heffer. Yeah, so I'm Ray Heffer. Um, again, I work for VMware. I'm in the end user computing business unit. And basically, what that means is technical enablement and marketing. So a lot of what I do is, is working with customers, but also gathering uh, technical material for sessions such as this one. Yep. So in today's session, I'm going to start with a bit of a high-level overview of uh, VMware and their horizon and strategy. Um, Ray's going to go into de detail on sizing for uh, 3D and RDSH. I'll talk about some competitive analysis we've done with Citrix um, and some horizon uh, vSAN testing we've done and finish off with some uh, best practices. Uh, standard disclaimer, you've probably seen this on most slides, we don't really talk about any futures here. Um, so VMware now has what we call our workspace suite. So what we did call workspace is now identity manager. Now we have workspace suite, which combines uh, a range of products. What was view is now horizon, um, as well as AirWatch and uh, various other components to bring all these together. Uh, for this session, we're going to be focusing on Horizon Desktop and RDSH and how to size those for uh, best performance. So here's the RDS, RDC uh, quadrant slide that was released earlier this year. You've probably seen this in a few sessions, but um, this was quite a good one for VMware after we've made a few acquisitions, um, investments in our own product, released RDSH uh, in view last year. And finally, they felt that VMware has leapfrogged Citrix into the leader in the uh, EUC, into the virtual desktop space. So how many people have replaced Citrix with Horizon? Not many. What about how many have replaced Horizon with Citrix? OK, everyone's pretty in-depth. Who would agree that VMware is now leading Citrix from a functionality point of view in virtual desktop space? No. Only a few, OK. A few. So RDS hosted apps was probably a key area where we, we did lag behind Citrix until uh, last year when we released hosted applications. And now with U6.2, we've added 3D capability to RDS apps. So we also have RDS session desktops, our virtual desktops, and thin apps. And VMware's strategy is about being able to deliver uh, all of the EU services from our single platform. So virtual desktop was, for a long time, a solution looking for a problem. Uh, security and compliance was something that uh, was generally what drove a virtual desktop uh, solution, or the OPEX savings of being able to manage things in a central manner. But now with the Internet of Things, business mobility, user uh, own devices, that's really driven the need for uh, a much more agile and a change in how to deliver EUC services. But the problem we had with, uh, with virtual computing is that vSphere was built up from server infrastructure. So 3D graphics was an area that has long been an issue, how to deliver that to users in a cost-effective manner. So vGPU, which uh, came out, I think, was it last year? Yeah. Yep. Um, offered the capability of sharing a graphics adapter and delivering it out to multiple users. Uh, this slide's a bit of an eye test. Um, goes into a lot of detail about how to set it up, but uh, this session will be recorded so we get access to all this content, and there's some good white papers that um, go into detail on how to set it up. Just a quick show of hands, I'm interested. Anyone using um, vGPU today? Oh, great, quite a few. Wow. Of you. Excellent. It's a good adoption. This one I find is a little bit more interesting for this discussion around how we evolved with our uh, graphics offering. So we first brought out Soft3D which really only targeted the low-end users, you know, gave people access to Aero. VSGA, being able to uh, share a graphics adapter, but there was a lot of uh, issues with compatibility. It doesn't support all the uh, DirectX libraries and things like that. So then we went to VDGA, which offered pass-through and passing a graphics adapter straight to a desktop. It was fantastic for these high-end applications, but it wasn't really cost-effective if you're targeting higher consolidation ratios. So finally, vGPU came through, which offered this mediated pass-through of sharing a single GPU among multiple users. 
but there was still one gap in our solution, and that was RDSH. So RDSH, or uh, published applications, has long been something that uh, our customers have been asking for, and we provided that capability last year, and now we've managed to hit the additional use cases of offering 3D applications uh, to users. Thanks, Travis. Um, just on that note, actually, I urge you to, if you go to YouTube and type in VMware End User Computing, um, in a couple of weeks there will be a video published on setting up vGPU with RDSH. It's less than 10 minutes, and that's really, literally how long it takes, but it's a, it's a really good video, so do look out for that one. If you subscribe to that, you, you'll see it when it comes up. So sizing. So how do we size? Uh, this is VDI straight RDSH. Let's have a look. So we, we, we do have some challenges. Um, first of all, you know, capacity, sizing, planning. Yeah, what, we, we need to do this assessment. You know, us as architects and consultants, you know, we've, we've been doing this for a long time now. We're used to going into a customer and running an assessment and really understanding the workloads that are running. Um, we need to capture what, what's happening there. And this is end to end. You know, end to end hardware architecture. Um, for example, we need to be do some comparison. As part of the engagement, as consultants that we take, we understand the existing workload. We obviously work on designs, you know, high-level design into you know, physical designs. But we don't just then deploy it into production and then hope for the best and hope we've just made all the right choices. You know, we're human. We make mistakes. Um, and this is what I'm going to talk about today: is, is how we. Uh, start sizing and benchmarking the workload and there's something called view planner which I'll, I'll go into in a moment. So we need a tool to simplify these. So with RDSH, you know, this is how, let's build this slide up a bit. We have hosted desktops, we have RDS sessions, we have RDS apps and there's 2D and there's 3D as well. Um, and this is why we did this video um, recently which will be published to YouTube for 3D RDSH. You, you wouldn't normally associate heavy 3D workloads with remote desktop. You know, it's always traditionally been office apps. You know, you're, you're, that, that's the typical use case. But with vGPU, you can deliver very high performance uh, 3D workloads to RDS sessions. Obviously, this is not sharing, um, this is sharing a GPU uh, to multiple users on an RDS host, for example, or multiple GPUs. And then there's 2D. Uh, we still have that use case, but we still need to size for those. You know, there's different uh, degrees of workload. Are you know, they just a light office user, um, or they're using something more advanced uh, on RDS as well? So this is really to signify we need a, like a cookie cutter approach, a tool to, to achieve this. Um, this is where I'd like to introduce View Planner. Um, it's been around a long time. Um, in fact, quick show of hands, who's used View Planner? Great. Okay, a good number of you. Um, we still use this heavily internally, um, and my colleague that's not here today, uh, he would normally be presenting on this session, uh, Bannett Agrawal, um, has been running a, a number of um, benchmarks, and, and he, he's uh, worked very, you know, extensively with View Planner for a number of years now, and I'd like to share some, uh, some of what we do with it. So the current version is View Planner 3.5. Um, and I mentioned benchmarking, and it's, it's worth highlighting this. View Planner um, has two modes available. There's benchmarking and there's a flexible mode. And we're talking of benchmarking here. It's a very um, specific configuration, so it's predictable. You know, we're not just having different configurations with uh, you know, different environments. Um, we have a, a number of clients um, and then a workload, in, in other words, the virtual desktop or an RDSH session. Um, and the, the clients, uh, you know, running a number of sessions. We have like two clusters, and I'll run through the architecture in a moment. But it drives a workload, and um, when I say a workload, this is what a user would be doing. Examples here: Office 2010, PowerPoint, video. Um, it will open emails, um, open an attachment, switch to a browser, and it will it will kind of simulate what a typical um, workload is for for a typical. Uh, Office user, but it, it does more than that. We can actually deliver um, heavy 3D graphics. So I'll, I'll touch on that as well. Um, it mentions think time, think time of five seconds for a medium user, two seconds for a heavy user. Essentially, all, all think time is, is if it's opening a PowerPoint presentation in the simulation, how long does it look at that before switching to an email? And it might sit there for five seconds before opening a, an, an Excel spreadsheet. And if you imagine you have a number of hosts with then 50, 60, 100 even, um, sessions running, virtual machine sessions running. There's all these workloads 
um, you loading up your hosts. Then going back to the design, all those assumptions we made um, and the design decisions we made to deliver on performance and, and availability and so on, we've now got this workload running. We've got this active cluster with stuff going on, you know, in a, for hours. It could be a typical working day. And this is what View Planner is about. Um, and sure, at the end of it, you know, we've got benchmarking and stats we're going to show you, but just as a tool for a consultant, it's fantastic because there's nothing better than having like, free access to this. You can go into ESX Top, look at vCenter Performance, speak to the storage guys if you're using a SAN, see what's going on there. So, you know, it's, it's a and really generate uh, PC over IP traffic. Of course. Yeah, networking bandwidth for that yep. as well. It's, it's fantastic for that. Um, and that diagram shows you the architecture of, of how that's set up. And I mentioned that there's a client and then there's the workload. Um, and in the bottom left there, you can see the client VMs and the actual uh, desktops themselves running the workload on, on, the, on the right. And they would be typically separate clusters, you know, separate hosts. And I did mention flexible mode. I'll just clarify what that is. If you don't want to do benchmarking, you just want to start a workload. You don't have to run it in that configuration. There are options um, to do that. I think it's internal only to VMware. Yeah, so the, um, the GA version that you can download the VM website is only uh, benchmark mode. Yeah. So, okay, this is an interesting one. Bring your own application um, in View Planner. So I talked about Office. Um, the standard apps is Firefox, you know, your Office apps, Outlook, and so on. Adobe Acrobat is another example. It even has some video files that will launch uh, some video media to play, to do video playback in there. But because of benchmarking, if we're going to be delivering 3D applications, for example, with RDS, we, we want 3D applications in that workload. And we can absolutely do that with View Planner. So there's the regular workload I was talking about. Nothing surprising there. I've talked about all those uh, components, video, office, for example. But here's the 3D workload. Um, we have the Unigin engine. Um, and in fact, the first time I set up VDGA, this is on Linux, I ran the Unigin Heaven benchmark and it looks really cool because we've got 3D graphics and it looks great. It's good for demo purposes. But obviously there's Autodesk, you know, Siemens, uh, SolidWorks, and more. More that's not limited to those. So you can run any of your 3D workload applications in View Planner in benchmarking mode to really get an understanding then of how your hosts are performing, how, how the performance is being delivered, as Travis said, PC over IP as well. So to extend on that, I said that you know, it's more than those applications. Um, Unigin, by the way, that's a free download. You can go to the Unigin website and there's various benchmarks and it will tell you the frames per second. It will run... Um, the same sequence, so no matter what, you know, if it's a virtual desktop or RDS, you can benchmark that, look at the frame rate, for example, but other things like spec as well. In fact, I'll go and show you some charts in a moment on, on those. So what we did um, internally, we've got a test bed here, so we're using View Planner, and you can see we've got physical servers on the left, so this is our you know, vSphere clusters, for example, our ESXi hosts, um, with client virtual machines. So this is basically the end user. We're simulating, I'm, I'm the, the user now, going to log on to a virtual desktop. So the client VMs in this case is Windows 7, two vCPUs and one and a half gig of RAM. This isn't the virtual desktop, this is just simulating the, the client. And then we have separate cluster, these physical servers on the right, which were um, running on Dell, um, the R720 uh, servers, 12 cores, 512 gigabytes of RAM. We had two NVIDIA grid, K2 cards, um, and if you've seen the NVIDIA guys this week, you can have a look at those. The, the K2s have two GPU cores on them. Um, again, we ran ESX, uh, ESXi 6, uh, Horizon 6, and so on. So these were running the virtual desktops. Um, so the virtual desktops, Windows 7, again, Service Pack 1, but a, a slightly uh, you know, higher specification than the client. So four virtual CPUs. 20 gig of RAM, and this was for the spec benchmark. You know, bear in mind we're running a heavy 3D workload here. So that was the setup, um, and as Travis mentioned, the remote display protocol, we can measure that as well because they're on two separate environments. In fact, you could place these in two data centers and see what yep. the WAN, WAN bandwidth is doing. So you don't have to do this in one data center. But they have to be under the same vCenter. Yeah. yeah. So I mentioned frames per second, or the FPS, but these are some of the other metrics that we, we look at. So the GPU statistics. So if you're using NVIDIA Grid, for example, uh, vGPU, 
there's the NVIDIA-SMI. That's a system management interface for NVIDIA. Um, NVIDIA have got this very well documented, so if you go to their website, you will find that. But you can get a whole bunch of stats off there, even down to power and wattage and you know, which uh, virtual machines are running on which cores and so on. Um, the application response time. And this is really the core of what, what View Planner is doing. It's, it's all well and good saying, OK, I'm running this workload and I've got Office apps and videos and Outlook opening things. That's great. But what's good? What's bad? Um, we can be looking behind the scenes while that's happening. And this is where View Planner comes into its own. It's going to give us a, basically a pass or fail, but also show us the latency of all these operations, an open, a close, a save, you know, switching applications and so on. Um, and we, we have this, you know, we have a chart that we can produce out of this. And you can see what's expected. And, you know, if, if it's weak in a certain area, you know, maybe it's storage letting you down. Maybe you've selected the wrong vGPU profile or, or whatever. But that's, that's the purpose of the benchmarking. Yeah, and then over 50 metrics of the server for the run. So as I said, you know, we're looking behind the scenes. Um, ESX, you know, going into vCenter performance. ESX top is a good one. You know, there's key metrics that we would look at as consultants, um, especially for multi-processor VMs. You know, look at, make sure there's not co-stop scheduling. Um, there's some guidance in a KB article on this. Make sure there's not uh, CPU ready time, for example, where um, a vCPU is waiting to be scheduled on a, on a core. So you can really get into detail while that, that workload's running. And bear in mind, this is all before any of your users log into the system. So you can make sure you're going to deliver you know, blinding performance before uh, anyone starts complaining about it. <laughs> so I talked about frames per second here. Um, essentially what this is saying, and you can see that along the bottom there it says number of virtual machines. I think in this case it was a K2 and the K240Q profile. I think that was a gig of RAM. Yep. So we're up to, 16, um, up to 16 sessions here. What this is showing is that the FPS, so this is Katia, uh, we've, we've got Showcase in there, you've got a number of different um, spec uh, benchmarks. Oh, it says K240Q at the top, I didn't see that. So this scales. What this isn't saying, but to go on to the next chart, might make it a bit clearer. This doesn't mean if you're running one VM, you're getting about 15 frames per second, and then you go to 16 VMs, you're running 450. That, that's not what this shows. This is showing that the host that this is running on with vGPU can, and this is the M60 by the way, the new Maxwell, and a show of hands, who's, um, you're familiar with the NVIDIA's new Maxwell graphics cards? Okay, if you're not familiar, um, go, definitely go and see those guys today if you can, and they announced this at VMworld US uh, just recently, they have these new Maxwell uh, graphics cards, um, much higher density as well, it's double the density of the, the K2. But what this is saying is running 16 VMs on this ESXi host, the FPS scales, we don't have a drop in, in the frame rate. So for each one, say it's 60 frames per second on each of the benchmarks, we're not losing that. Um, this scales, we're not suffering as a result of, of scaling the number of VMs. And this is where you have to select this vGPU profile correctly, because the K240Q, uh, which I mentioned there, that's giving you a frame... Um, um, video memory for the frame buffer. So it does depend on the use case. If they're just going to be wanting the air, you, know, you mentioned Aero in Windows 7 or maybe Google Earth, then this is way overkill. <laughs> but if they're a very heavy um, CAD user, for example, and they, they want the highest performance graphics, obviously your consolidation is going to go down. You might not be able to scale so high because you're going to be allocating more of that frame buffer memory on the, the Maxwell card um, for those users. So you've got to get that, that fine line. But this is where V Planner will come into it, you can run those applications and simulate those applications first and see how your, your workloads perform. And then just another note on here, so in this particular case, these were the Dell R720s. Um, just skipping down the bottom, again, the VM configuration, um, there's one gig of VRAM, so that was the, the K240Q profile, four vCPUs. 20 gig of RAM um, seems a lot, but for a lot of uh, 3D applications, that isn't uncommon. Um, I normally see at least 16 gig of RAM for um, customers. I've got car manufacturer in the UK, for example. They, the small list 3D users using 16 gig of RAM. So, you know, that's quite representative of what, what's happening today. So, 3D performance in RDSH. Scale out, don't scale up. Um, okay, so some key points here. 
there's a lot of factors to sizing your RDSH hosts. You know, we've talked about 3D, but you may just be running 2D workloads. 3D might not apply to you. Um, there is some guidance here. These are based on our tests internally. Where it says two to one CPU over commitment, this was what we did on the View Planner test. Yeah. This isn't a real life production deployment here. There's a, there's a white paper with all these details. It was posted uh, late last year. This came out of. Um, and they, ca they found, so I think the caveats here is they found they got the, um, the closest to their threshold. So best performance really means uh, best cost for performance. So View Planner reports against real time and, and non interactive, so interactive, non interactive tasks. So for a pass, you need to get 95% of your uh, interactive tasks must be less than a second, and 95% uh, of your non interactive tasks, like saving a file and that sort of thing, must be less than six seconds. So the test they did, and they go through this all in, the, in that white paper, they found that at two to one overcommit um, with eight vCPU on um, eight core sockets, they that hit got the closest to those thresholds before exceeding. So in a synthetic benchmark environment, that was the best performance. In a real world environment where you have real users where um, performance is probably going to be uh, more important, typically we see one to one overcommit, uh, sorry, the so no overcommit, one core, um, one virtual core per physical core, and probably four CPU RDSH servers, but still scale out is that general message, rather than having a 32 CPU RDSH server. If you want to get deeper on this one, and this has been around for a long time, I think ESX3, I'm going way back now, we introduced uh, relaxed co-scheduling. Yep. So actually before that, way back, ESX 2.5, and this is strict yeah. co-scheduling. So um, essentially a VM was a world, and then yep. how many CPUs. Yep. The, the, if you, there's a white paper on that. It's quite old, but it still applies. Yep. And probably the reason that was showing as good is because of the relaxed co-scheduling that we do. It's not, if you've got a four virtual CPU VM, that's not the equivalent to four single BCPU yeah. VMs. It's not the same thing. And when you're running a synthetic benchmark, you have every RDSH server running at 80% utilization, whereas in the real world, you've got them all sort of jumping up and yeah, down, and exactly. it makes scheduling a lot harder than if they're all just pegged at 100% because a view plan is just hitting them as hard as it can. So really, I'd say a key takeaway from this slide alone, make a note, one to one, <laughs> uh, aim for that one to one ratio, so don't overcommit the number of um, physical vCPUs, the virtual CPU cores to physical cores on, on the host. So if you have two sockets, 10 cores per socket, then that's 20 yep. vCPUs basically, is one to one, one mapping. So some more uh, stats then, again on the Maxwell M60, and this is new, um, this is only recently, as I say, it was recently announced by NVIDIA at VMworld US. Um, what we're saying here, again, is that the number of the frames per second, again, don't misread this, we're not getting better FPS, just as we scale up, this is as we scale, we're not having a drop in the, on each uh, session, each 3D session. So, for example, if each one was running 60, 70 frames per second, then we're not getting a drop there. But this is just to show you the test bed. So in this uh, example, it was a Dell um, R730, two socket Haswell, 384 gig of RAM, and two of the new NVIDIA uh, M60 uh, GPUs. Um, software, Horizon 6, so it says View 15H2, that's our internal name, but that's Horizon 6.2, I had to translate that. Uh, and the benchmark in this case was Solid Edge. Now this is running not VMs, unlike the last example, this is RDSH uh, virtual machines. So these are sessions here, not virtual machines along the bottom. But again, really what this shows is CPU utilization as well is a factor, and especially on particular 3D applications, CPU is key. And we work very closely with NVIDIA, and I was with them um, a few months ago with a customer, and we saw um, that CPU, their sweet spot for a number of the uh, like TeamViewer, Autodesk, is about 3.1 gigahertz for CPU as well. So that's just worth noting. So don't ignore CPU. Um, storage I.O. is another factor. So we're not just talking graphical performance here. Lots of these apps do need um, you know, all flash, for example. And we, we ran various benchmarks internally with this customer, running SSD, NVMe cards, which were amazingly quick, yeah. um, and so on. So there's a number of factors to sizing. Um, again, SolidWorks Viewer, 
um, we're seeing similar results. We scaled up to 32 sessions in this case, um, and you can see this, the VM configuration. Um, you don't need to take notes for this. You will get a copy of these slides as well um, after this week. Hand back to you, Travis. Yep. Um, so when we released uh, View 6, we changed our default settings for PC over IP. So PC over IP was originally configured for best, uh, best quality out of the box. Um, the key setting was build to lossless. So every image by default would build to a completely lossless image, which created quite a lot of bandwidth. But what we found was that the difference between build to lossless and what we would call perceptually lossless, that is, build to good enough, was very minor in most cases. Unless you're a doctor examining an x-ray, um, or those very high fidelity, high fidelity graphic requirements, we found that build to lossless setting was overkill for 90% of our use cases. So but we that changed. patient wouldn't have much fun, would they? What's that? If the doctor's looking at an no. x-ray and you've got some strange artifact and you, you know, you've got three yes. months to live. <laughs> no, it's, right. it's just the PCA by P protocol wasn't optimized properly. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, so we changed our default settings and disabled build to lossless and a few other settings in view 6.0, which reduced our um, PC over IP band bandwidth requirements considerably out of the box. So we did some tests around comparing PC over IP with RDP8 and ICA. Now this was set up for RDSH uh, sessions. So this configuration was 60 sessions, 8 vCPU, 2012 R2 RDS VM. Um, so we're comparing with Citrix uh, Zen Desktop, Zen App 7.1, and RDS 8 on 2012. Can I just mention as well, it mentions um, the think time, and I talked about that. View Planner has this concept of think time, but also iterations as well, and that's important because it, will run a, it won't just run the test once, it will run again, and in this case it's three iterations of the test, and as you were saying, it's the 95th percentile, it's yep. 95%, so it, 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 it will fail if it doesn't complete the number of iterations, it won't pass, so it's, to, it's not just a one-off, yep. um, so that's important to note. And these are the results we got from our CPU uh, usage. So we found that RDP was better than the other two by a small margin, so 3%, so barely statistically significant. PC over IP and, and ICA were basically identical, and you can see the, the profiles there of the three protocols, and they all, they're all pretty similar. RDP sort of bottoms out um, a little bit uh, lower than the other protocols. And then we looked at our bandwidth usage, and this is what most customers really asked for detail on. Uh, when they're comparing the different solutions is how much bandwidth will I need because particularly if we're talking about a WAN environment this is uh, might be a significant cost to the overall uh, environment. It's probably fair to say that if we did this session a year, maybe two years ago, yep. these would be very different. Yes, so, yeah. so PCRIP by default used to be much higher than this and we would we always would say but this is because of our graphics but in the end we as I said, we changed our default settings, but if you are deploying to a doctor who is going to be doing x-rays, then... then give, give them the bandwidth. Yes, yeah. D default settings are not the, the ones to use. Um, and here we found that PCROP was about 10% better than RDP, and a little bit under 10% better than ICA. So we got 44.7 kilobytes per session with PC over IP, 50 with RDP, and 48.4 with ICA. So... PCROP fared very well in this case, which was um, very good to see. So Windows 10 came out this year, a lot of fanfare. Uh, Microsoft are saying they've got, what, 100 million devices yeah. now? It's massively popular. Yep, it's running on my MacBook. Uh, no more Mac OS for me. I'm so. doing that. I was going to do that, actually. I was going to install Windows 10 on my Mac, but I thought I'd better not do it before VMworld because I've got <laughs> sessions to present. So, yeah, I'll be doing that when I get back. <laughs> but so we've done some tests because people are going to be asking for sizing on Windows 10, so we wanted to have a look at how this compares to Windows 7, where we have a lot of experience with. So we've set up our view planner environment. So Windows 10, 64-bit. I'm hoping you're not going to have customers doing 32-bit. I mean, let's get away from that. <laughs> uh, one CPU, two gigs of RAM, and view 6.2. So this is running on a 20-core Ivy Bridge or flash storage array. The reason we're using all flash storage is because we're focusing on our compute resources. It's a case of we don't want storage to impact our results. This is all about compute that we're looking at here. 
Um, client VM is not really that important. Um, so these are just what we're using to run our PC over IP sessions. Um, they're on Windows 7 machines, one CPU, one gigs of RAM. And this is what I was talking about, our group A and group B. So group A is interactive tasks, so scrolling through a document, things where the user needs instant feedback. And group B is non-interactive, so opening a file, saving a file, closing a file. And our passing criteria is one second for group A, six seconds for group B at the 95th percentile. And this is what we found with Windows 10. So you can see here, our, we hit our group A tasks first. So at group A, at 120 VMs on a 20 core system, so six users per core, our group A have hit the threshold of one second. We still have some headroom actually in, uh, in group B, but that's probably because we're using an all flash array for those more I.O. intensive tasks. If we compare this to Windows 7, we're seeing about 15% lesser consolidation after our optimizations. Before our optimizations, we're only getting 90 VMs uh, per host. But after optimizations, we got 120 VMs per host. And these are some of the optimizations that we did. So some of them are going to be the same as Windows 7. Um, things like optimizing for best performance for your uh, the graphics experience. But there's also a few others specific to Windows 10, like tracking and telemetry, which Windows, Microsoft used to track what the users are doing and get feedback and build a better Windows. But it does use quite a lot of resources, as does Cortana, first sign animation, and various unnecessary services, and video smoothing, which is quite CPU intensive because it uses the CPU to smooth out video. So we are working on an optimizer tool and a blog. So hopefully that will be out soon. Um, that will be up on the VMware website. Hey, just a quick show of hands. Who's using the OS optimization tool today? That was a great fling, wow. wasn't it? Excellent. Yeah. That was so you're really eager to see that support yeah. Windows 10 and say we're working on it. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, definitely yeah. the most downloaded was, one, for sure. Yeah, amazing. It was so good when we got that in. Uh, so VDI performance. So we have done some tests on View 6.2 to compare against 6.1. So same setup as before with our 20 core uh, Ivy Bridge systems. Uh, Windows 7 32 bit here, one CPU, one gig of RAM. Client VMs, same as before. And View 6.2 hasn't really changed much. Uh, I mean, performance, for PC over IP, we haven't changed any uh, tuning in 6.2. There are more uh, interactive variables you can use to change different settings. But in general, um, 6.1, 6.2, if you're upgrading from one to the other, you're not going to see any difference in consolidation ratios. So this was getting Windows 7, seven users per core. So then our performance team looked at uh, VSAN performance. So these are different nodes to what we were using before because of the requirements for vSAN storage. So here we have three identical nodes, so we need a minimum of three nodes for a vSAN cluster. Uh, 12 core, uh, two 12 core CPUs, and we're using one CPU, 32 bit Windows 7 VMs. This is an all flash vSAN cluster. So we have two disk groups with three disks per group. Uh, 400 gig SSDs is our cache tier, and 800 gig SSDs are making up our capacity tier. We've got three of those sitting in each disk group. Uh, 10 gig network for vSAN, dedicated for vSAN, um, and then a 1 gig VM network. So this is running a dedicated link clone pool, which means it has a one failure to tolerate setting. That means every write operation is replicated one time. It's like a RAID 1 array. And this is what we found, similar to what we were looking at at our all flash array. We hit our group A threshold before our group B. So we got 160 users per node, and they reckon we can run even more, so 200 medium users per node. Um, like the all flash array, uh, vSAN all flash really it has benefits when you're looking at 
users that have a very high IO, high IO profile. So users doing a lot of non-interactive tasks, working with a lot of big documents, things that need to save, open, write, read, a lot of data. And now we're going to go into some of our performance best practices. So in terms of vSphere, um, generally we recommend the latest version, although that's not always best because there was a little bug in vSphere 6.0 that did cause problems with um, hardware version 11 VMs. So if you are on 6.0, you may get better performance on hardware version 10, um, but that's been fixed in update 1. So ideally upgrade to vSphere as soon as possible and then use the latest hardware version for your virtual machines. Our view storage accelerator, so this is called our content-based read cache which caches commonly read blocks in uh, physical memory on each host. Great for boot storms, great for login storms, really reduces your read ops um, to your replica disk. We've seen, I think, efficiencies of up to 70% yep. enabling this, and as you say, it's host memory. Yep. It's, it's two, a maximum of two gig of host memory, which to be honest, these days, and the majority of yeah, the customers I see, that is not a lot when you yep. look at hosts with 384, 512 gig, yeah. you know, two gig is nothing. So it's definitely worth enabling that. Uh, and particularly for a vSAN environment, this is great because now you get, um, you, know, you get a DRAM tier, then you get a, a cache tier and a capacity tier. Um, so pretty much always enable that. The only time I haven't seen customers enable it is with when they're using um, Extreme IO and those sort of heavily uh, flash systems. You know, they just don't see any real benefit. They're not storage constrained. Um, on that note, flash wherever possible. Um, it's a nice thing to say, particularly when you're sitting in a lab in Palo Alto doing tests. You know, it's not always cost effective, which is why we do have things like our hybrid vSAN. Storage vendors do have uh, multiple tiers in their storage, but certainly for our replicas, our high read disks, put them on flash, and then use, uh, use disks that meets your I.O. requirements where possible and so you can get the cost that you need. Um, these IOPS and CPU requirements, uh, I'm always a little bit uncomfortable saying typical IOPS, typical CPU, because then people use these and write a design against them and realize they're completely wrong for their workloads and, and then they need to buy a new storage array and I've seen it happen. Um, I mean, they say about 7 to 12 IOPS, which is probably still quite on the low side. Um, as Ray mentioned earlier, ideally run an assessment. We now have a free cloud-based assessment service assessment.vmware.com. It uses Lakeside SysTrack. You log in, fill out the details, download the agents, uploads, uh, install the agents on your physical desktops, uploads the data to the cloud, and you can get great reports, um, great dashboard, really see the IOPS for, what you, for each user, for each application, for each desktop, and that will really help you with sizing. You don't need to go to uh, you know, rule of thumbs. Just, just like to mention as well, you mentioned Lakeside SysTrack, yep. it's cloud-based. Um, my team as well, we're working very closely with Lakeside um, and we're developing another tool. We talked about the OS optimization tool, um, a horizon sizing tool or an estimator. Um, now we're working with Lakeside on that because we would like the ability to export an assessment from Lakeside. You know, you've already done the assessment and this is really critical to successful deployments. I, I can't reiterate that enough. Um, so you've got this assessment with IOPS and CPU requirement in megahertz and so on. You can now import that into this sizing tool. So today, um, if you're a partner, in fact, quick show of hands, how many of you are uh, VMware partners? Okay, so you will all get access to this today. If you go to vmware.com slash go slash horizon calc, um, that will direct you to it. Um, or you ping me on Twitter or send me an email, you can get access that way. Eventually, we will open this up to everybody. Um, it might be a slightly different version. Um, but this is taking in these metrics and then helping with the sizing. So all this stuff we've talked about, we've gone from assessment and design and then testing before production, essentially, and benchmarking. But what about a little bit before that? You want some ideas of, okay, how many hosts will I need? How many connection servers or how many sessions per RDSH host? And that's what this tool is for. So today, that's partners only. Um, it's still closed beta, um, but it's just so you know this is, this is coming. Yep, and same, same goes for CPU. You can say three to 500 megahertz, but uh, ultimately it depends on your applications and your users. Um, some of the memory best practices, though, are a bit more relevant. 
So uh, vSphere for a long time has had a great feature called transparent page sharing. So that was the ability to share the same pages between multiple VMs uh, with the, from the, and map each guest memory to the same physical pages. Fantastic when you have a lot of the same operating system running the same application on the same host like we see in VDI. By default, it is now disabled because there was a vulnerability discovered that you could, in a particular setup, someone could reverse engineer um, crypto keys. In an on-premise, single customer deployment where everybody's part of the same organization, very low risk that that vulnerability would cause a problem. So generally for desktop, we recommend enabling it, um, which you can do through the uh, View UI now, or the Horizon UI. Um, if you are going to use that and you're using 64-bit desktop operating system, I recommend disabling large memory pages. That would great, large memory pages greatly reduces the effect of, it, of transparent page sharing. So large memory pages are generally better in a server environment. In a desktop environment, it generally won't cause a performance impact to disable them, but you will get higher consolidation ratios because you'll uh, use less physical memory on each of your host. Uh, you can also increase the, increase the TPS scan speed. Uh, I think by default it's every 10 minutes that it will scan through pages, so looking for pages to, to save. Um, if you do a vMotion, if you hit a, put a host into maintenance mode, suddenly you're going to be using a lot more memory for 10 minutes. You can reduce that down. It incurs a small CPU overhead, um, but if you size your CPU well within limits, that's probably not going to cause any problems. Uh, networking. Um, if you're talking about a LAN, packet buffers on intermediate switches. Um, the problem with packet buffers is PCRP starts sending packets, they start buffering. On the client side, it starts thinking that they've been lost, um, and then it will throttle down PCRP, and suddenly users are getting quite a bad user experience. So um, if you are getting issues with um, PCRP on your LAN, check the switches for packet buffering. Worth mentioning actually, Teradici have a document on that. Yep. I cannot for the life of me remember the name of it, but you will find it. They, they've yeah. got a specific document. It's on called, uh, I think, PCROP Best Practices. Yeah. Goes into LAN, WAN, and some of the Wi Fi optimizations for PC over IP. Uh, some of our guest level optimizations, we've mentioned the, uh, um, the fling for optimization. The one thing I always say with optimizations don't just launch it, select all, and click go. Have a think about each of these optimizations. What is the impact to your users and to your applications? Do you want to disable Windows themes? You will get better consolidation, but your users may not like you very much. <laughs> it's a trade-off. So have a think about them. What's going to be relevant to your project? Um, but some of them we do recommend, I mean, right-sizing CPU. If you've been doing virtualization for a long time, this has been a common thing because the more, more virtual CPUs the system has, the harder it is to schedule. Uh, memory, um, at the end of the day, right-sizing memory is about cost. Um, you can give them all 4 gigs of RAM or 10 gigs of RAM, you're just going to need to buy more memory and more storage for your virtual machine cells. Uh, network adapter, VMX Net 3 is generally preferred. Storage adapter, there's not real much difference nowadays with the PV SCSI and the LSI logic. Uh, always use the latest version of VMware tools. Um, change the visual settings to best performance. I find that for most of those settings, it actually does give a better user experience. For example, menu fading looks horrible on a PC over IP connection. If you disable memory, menu fading, now the menus pop up instantly. And the reason for that is every pixel is changing. Yep. If you've got every pixel for that menu, or even if you've got a whole background fading or something, everything, every pixel is changing, so it's data transmit. Yep. Um, other various window settings, you know, disabling hibernation, um, fading effects, and last access timestamp will reduce your I.O. Can I just reiterate one point on there, actually, that you mentioned, Travis, you mentioned about uh, virtual swap files. Yep. Um, the VM, or the virtual machine memory, if you don't add a memory reservation, um, you will have a virtual swap file equivalent to the, the configured virtual machine memory. So if you had, say, 4 gig of uh, RAM on your virtual machine, there's a 4 gig virtual swap file. Um, but that's, that swap file is equal to 
the memory minus any reservation you set, and that's in a percentage. So if you set a 100% memory reservation, and I would always recommend that where you, where you can, because you're guaranteeing, guaranteeing memory for the VM, 100% then there is no swap file. You yep. eliminated that, and that's a great storage yeah. saver, but you're guaranteeing memory as well. So. Yeah, absolutely. So if the, and the hosts aren't, aren't um, if you aren't over-provisioning memory, then there aren't really any drawbacks. The other thing with excessive memory is, of course, the Windows swap file. Um, the more memory, the bigger the Windows swap file should be. And there's been a lot of talk about disabling it, reducing it. I mean, ultimately, Windows is designed to use a swap file. Um, in view, we have something called a disposable disk. So a disposable disk is designed to be deleted at power off, but it is only deleted in certain instances. A disposable disk is only deleted when view powers off a virtual machine. It is not deleted if the user powers it off or if you power it off in vSphere. What this means is if you use disposable disk and you have your power on policy set to always power it on or to do nothing, your disposable disks will never be deleted. So if you are going to use disposable disks, you need to cycle your power policy periodically to power it off and then back to power it on to clear out the disposable disk. There's a blog article I wrote on this about a year ago. It's on the VMware website. Um, it goes into f all the details on disposable disks. That's a really good tip. Yeah. <laughs> and also, don't have dynamic sizing of the page files. Stat yes. Static, obviously, this defeats the purpose. You've got growing and shrinking. That, that's more storage I.O. as well. Okay, so just some uh, notes on PC over IP. Um, build to lossless. Travis mentioned this. Um, we recommend that's, that's off. And as, as Travis mentioned, if you're in particular use cases where you need a lossless image, an x-ray for example, or you want to deliver the, you know, maybe it's a, a media um, magazine editor, they, they don't want to see any artifacts because that may be in the original photo, then sure, enable build to lossless, but it does dramatically reduce the bandwidth. And PC over IP, when this is, um, when build to lossless is on, PC over IP is designed to, it's very spiky, it's just going to deliver that as quickly as it can, so the bandwidth is going to go bang. And you yep. know, if you've got any limits or you're, you certainly don't cap bandwidth, then, then you're going to have a the really negative effect, effect on performance. So just think carefully when, when you need to enable that. Again, another optimization tip is the maximum uh, initial image quality here, um, 80%. Um, session audio, you may not need audio at all. Um, so you know, look at disabling it or, or reducing the, the, you know, the audio quality if you can do that. And frame, frame rates as well. Um, does an office user really need 30, 40, 50, 60 frames per second? No, they don't. Um, 15, I find for office, and I use a virtual desktop within VMware at 15 frames per second, and it is perfectly fine. It's, I just use it for office and web browsing. Um, so, you know, again, it's about delivering the best end user experience, but you don't need to go overboard. So you can um, certainly optimize that. And that's also, as well as uh, bandwidth, you can reduce your CPU usage as well with that one. And then the client side uh, cache size, we've got a recommendation there, 50 to 100 meg. Um, it does depend um, on the available client RAM, obviously, but that's, you know, it's small, it's a small number. Um, and this is the image, this is the client side image cache, by the way. So with RDSH, um, CPU, socket, and cores, and memory, and, and Luma nodes. One thing I just want to point you to is the optimization tool again for this. Um, remember what we said, even though a pass size is two to one on, on CPUs, one to one is best, I think, for real life for performance. Uh, performance. Absolutely. Um, yep. But maybe that's not a factor. It depends on the, on the workload again. Um, I just want to wrap up to leave some time for, for Q&A as well. Um, so just to wrap up here, vGPU, in Horizons, this Horizon View, that's now just Horizon 6, this yep. name changes, but um, vGPU provides far better density than vDGA. You know, this direct pass-through is one-to-one. -one. We're mapping a, a GPU core to a virtual machine or an RDS host. Um, vGPU is sharing that, that GPU core, and then we have this notion of vGPU profiles to determine the frame buffer size. Um, so you get much better consolidation. They're the tips we've already covered on RDSH sizing. Um, again, Windows 10, as Travis shown you um, just earlier, the, the, it's heavier in CPU compared to Windows 7. 
I wouldn't say it's massively, you know, certainly the OS optimizations that you've recommended. Um, well, in fact, one note on the OS optimizations for Windows 10. If you use Enterprise, the telemetry, the stuff it reports back, you can disable. If you use, I think, Pro or, or Home, I think there's a minimum level, you can't disable it. Um, so maybe you're looking at this in the lab and you're wondering why you can't disable it. Obviously, with Enterprise Windows 10, you can. Um, so that's just something to look out for. And then Virtual Sand 2.0, um, or now with, you know, with vSphere, you know, it's Virtual Sand 6.1, I think, yep. the, the, the latest version. Um, and we've shown you on a previous slide the N NVNE, so Travis mentioned the write cache, and I was using this PCI SSD. The, the NVMe was blinding performance. So I was working with a customer recently on this, um, and it is phenomenal. We only had two because they're more expensive than SSD. So write cache and then the other SSDs are higher. Still great performance, but obviously lower cost. Um, yeah, and then the last tip, performance best practices. Just make sure you do do some sort of optimization, tune your, your, your virtual machines or your RDSH sessions according to the workload that you've got in there. Some of these sessions have already happened, but you will get access to the recordings um, to these, so some uh, really recommended sessions that we would like to point out. Anything you want to call out in there, Travis? Or? Um. No. I'll just pick out all my ones and suggest yeah, you look at that. Yeah, my VSAN session is <laughs> yeah. But so that's reference to you. Obviously, you will get a copy of these slides as well, yep. so some reference there. Um, any questions? There's one down there. Um, it's just a quick question in regards to your Windows 10 benchmarking um, yep. that you did. Did you have any form of GPU offload when you did that within the servers, or was it pure CPU with no VSGA or anything else? Yeah, no, uh, there's no 3D in those. Okay, and have you tested with any kind of minor VSGA offload? Or uh, I haven't personally. I don't know if the performance team have themselves. Okay. But they're working on a white paper for Windows 10 performance, so that'll all be covered in that. Yeah. Uh, one down here. Uh, what's your experience with one vCPU in desktop? Because in my experience, uh, if a person watched the uh, Flash video on YouTube, yep. like from VMworld, not music or playing, uh, it really picked the CPU because Absolutely. it has computing Windows, yep. Flash, plus PC over IP on one yeah, CPU. Yeah, the only, if you're using a, an offload card, an Apex card, then you might get away with it for if they're doing any video. But uh, as soon as you add video into the mix, then generally two vCPU is going to be needed. Um, but the offload cards certainly help help with that if they are just using minor video. We, we used to recommend one vCPU back in the Windows XP yeah. days, but yeah, it's a minimum now. of it's two now. Anyone got any other questions? No, we'll hang around at the end as well, so if you want to come see us yep. uh, for some questions. Um, remember the survey? Um, oh, yes, please. Yeah, that helps us, that. Um, you know, improve the sessions for next year. So this session was uh, you know, delivered in a different format last year. Um, there's going to be you know, more detail in next year. So the feedback's really great for us as speakers and uh, content developers. But thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.